what you've been looking at as you've been coming in. Um, during a, a 2018 summit, um, Donald Trump offered Kim Jong a, a, a movie trailer style video projection of, of North Korea after the floodgates had been opened to the global marketplace. And while the global press found its Hollywood stylings completely inexplicable, Trump was really only offering the, the common currency of, of contemporary global real estate and, and trade. Just another of hundreds of similar examples produced in the render farms of real estate and infrastructure kingdoms all over the world. Uh, with all the um, monotony and repetition of porn, these three-minute cliches of global urbanism usually begin, or almost always begin, in outer space as a new era is dawning. And uh, typically in a city below, there's a Star Wars-style fly-through that threads through uh, a field of digital skyscrapers that are sprouting from the ground before swinging over industrial areas and container ports and resorts. And then a deep movie trailer voice comes on to announce all the neoliberal mantras of free trade, no taxes, cheap labor, streamlined customs, deregulation of labor and environmental law, what a feeling the theme from Flashdance plays as one video uh, advertises the city's logistical apparatus or a, a Yanni-like soundtrack accompanies magnificent claims now of, of world city urbanity that are enjoyed by doughy cartoon humans rhythmically waddling along boulevards or plowing forward stone-faced in pleasure boats or a population of villas flips into place. A flyover surveys a field of candy-colored villas and in the dramatic finale to the swelling theme from Titanic or something, there's confetti and glowing sunsets and bursting hearts and, and all this sort of panning back out into the stratosphere past fireworks and orbiting satellites. In the DP arcade that had already, you know, created its own ecstatic videos that map existing or projected economic zones for industry and tourism on the eastern coast or on the borders of Russia and China. And this is one that um, throughout it sort of shifts frantically through a number of up-tempo music themes, harps, organs, and polkas, and patriotic marches and lullabies and bongo interludes. And these videos are, are, are usually always promoting the most contagious formula for making entire cities in the world, a formula called the free zone that's legally exempt from laws regarding labor and environment, as we said, and that privileges the freedom of corporations and offshore finance and sweetened with these incentives and bathed in all this elaborate um, promotional fantasy, this massive uh, uh, global infrastructure installation of, of corporate capital is a major engine of inequality and labor abuse and environmental brinksmanship. But Trump and Kim or the zone are way ahead of everybody, doesn't bother them. They know that contemporary urbanism seems largely to be driven by, by two cultural addictions, uh, these mediagenic fa fantasies and a revenue stream. And this is the kind of space that I study, but I always say the same thing. I always say that what I'm doing might be something called medium design, because I'm often looking with half-closed eyes at the urban world looking at buildings with shapes and outlines, but also looking at the matrix of rules and relationships in which those buildings are suspended. And in the contemporary experience economy, that matrix is, as you well know, made up of repeatable formulas or spatial products, skyscrapers, malls, golf courses, resorts, franchises, parking lots, airports, ports, free zones. 
And these almost infrastructural rules and relationships aren't like infrastructure of pipes and wires under the ground, but an all too visible in enveloping urban medium or a spatial technology, something like spatial operating systems for the city. And this technological matrix is arresting for all its wild mixtures of quite grisly violence and candy-colored fairy tales because it's a secret weapon of stealthy political power and because it's creating de facto forms of polity and because it's rapidly generating a new layer of the Earth's crust. And these spaces and the, the powers that preside over them have often become what we could call sort of political superbugs really surviving against all odds to generate unchecked concentrations of power, extremes of inequality, and, and climate cataclysms. And so what do we have to uh, unwind the power of these superbugs? And, and the culture in its broadest sense is, is good at pointing to things and calling their name, but not so good at describing the relationship between things or the repertoires that things enact. I mean, we, we're still really living with a, a modern enlightenment mind uh, that's replaced God with, with ideologies, that privileges declarations and right answers and universals and is searching for the elementary particle it's captivated by circular logics, by modernist scripts that celebrate freedom, things like freedom and transcendent newness, narrative arcs that are bending towards utopian or dystopian ultimates. And this, this enlightenment mind that looks for the one or the one and only is so often organized like a closed loop wanting to only circulate compatible information. And since, and since the, the, the loop that, 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 that only wants to hear and only wants to exist in a kind of echo chamber can't abide contradiction, it lashes out with a binary fight when it's challenged. So as part of that modern enlightenment script, favoring succession of ideas rather than coexistence of ideas, the new right answer must kill the old right answer. And in some fatal error, we are creatures who trained our mind to want to be right. Like we will all go to bed tonight, you know, thinking about the ways in which we were we were right all along. It's been pounded into our 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 brains from the very beginning. And under the sway of of, of maybe some additional modernist solutions, illusions, um, capital is an er enemy that subsumes all. A critical designer must defeat it absolutely. A conventional designer can only wait to be engaged by this market to prepare another right answer, a solution in the form of a building or a master plan. So it's you know culture that's continually oscillating between these loops and binaries is, is an unnecessarily violent culture that, that often is eliminating the very information it needs and, and banging away with the same blunt, inadequate tools. So when a bully is elected and a migration of refugees swells in number and shorelines flood due to global warming, um, it, what, what do we have? If, if economic and military engagement or new technologies don't provide the solution, if the consensus surrounding laws and standards and master plans provides no relief, it's as if the smartest people in the world are standing with hand to brow. And dissent, also adopting a binary of enemies and innocents, um, you know, it, it, and since the world's superbugs and bulletproof forms of power thrive on this oscillation between loop and binary, it's as if, as if there's nothing to counter them, only more ways of fighting and being right and providing the rancor that nourishes their violence. So how do you, how do you drop through a trap door to engage the other side of these logics? And the, 
this would be usually be the moment when you unleash your new radical proposal. But it, in this world, that would be really sad, sadly conservative. Because on this flip side, nothing is new and nothing is right. But maybe there's a chance to rehearse a habit of mind that's been eclipsed. So on the other side of that door, maybe it's easier to see at a different focal length. Beyond the declared ideologies is a matrix or medium of activities and latent potentials, the undeclared dispositions that are something like culture's mus muscle memory. Um, so this kind of medium thinking that I'm talking about and medium in this usage is um, clear of associations with, with communication technologies and is returning to its root medius, meaning middle or milieu. And just as this medium thinking, this kind of looking with half-closed eyes at the stuff in between the objects, um, just as it inverts the focus on the object and matrix, maybe it can offer some alternative approaches to intractable problems um, that have a chance of outwitting the most cunning superbugs. But I would argue that you already know how to do it. Um, it's, a, it's a blind spot that's, that's right in front of you. Uh, it's a terra incognita where you've already been. And it's a faculty that I think designers have in abundance. Designers are always reading the medium. They have something like, I mean, I think at our best, we have something like a canine mind because your dog, you know, when your dog hears you say, good girl, they understand the lexical expression. They know something about that, but they would never rely on that. Instead, they're looking at a thousand other affective cues, how close you are to the door, the dog bowl, whether you have a leash in your hand, even your temperament. Um, uh, and I think we are, um, you know, they, they, we are similarly good at, at, at reading potentials in arrangement. In a simple room, a designer sees objects with names, table, chair, lamp, pen, teapot, and so on, uh, but, but really sees them all bristling with some latent potential, some active repertoire. They are actively performing. Um, they are providing an affordance to another. The chair is at the same height as your knee. Um, the teacup has a handle for you to pick up. So we as designers look at space in the same way that a good cook looks at stuff in their fridge uh, and, and sees a kind of periodic table of, of possible combinations and expiration dates and latent potentials. It's really elementary for us as designers to see time-released potentials and arrangement in spaces and streets and networks. And in this canine split screen, kind of turning the sound down on those declarations, maybe it's also easier to detect the difference between what an organization is saying and what it's doing. How organizations decouple their messages and their ideologies from their real activities and underlying potentials or dispositions. So, you know, the smart city, for instance, that, that script but which we sometimes maintains the shine of the new, even though you can clearly see it centralizing information in ways that violate privacy and with a network that's actually quite primitive and crude in disposition, not at all um, sophisticated. Or a social media network purports to be information rich but it filters all that information through a dumb binary of likes and dislikes that actually erases information, that, that makes a network that's information poor. Or the global network of Dubai-style zone cities that we were just looking at this, you know, has a story about free trade um, when it's obviously manipulated trade. Or even, you know, a centralizing power espouses a populist message. 
or, or, or even both left, it's even so obvious that it's hard to even see, both left and right wing ideologies can result in concentrations of authoritarian power. So it's not the ideology that's declared, but some other potentials or latent dispositions that, that are undeclared that seem to be determining outcomes. It's even easier on this kind of flip side, it's even easier to see the superbug's special power. I mean, we know they want to keep everybody oscillating between loops and binaries where there will be no innovation and where they can cocoon and thrive. But that's child's play. Because uh, they also know how to manipulate declared ideologies to get to their real target, which is dispositions. Like, like a confidence man, they are also masters of the, split, split, of the split screen, of, of lies and distractions and confusions that even seem to turn lexical expressions into physical force fields. They know how lies work. Like they know that telling one lie is a really bad idea. One lie just calls for reconciliation and truth. But telling many lies is a really good idea. That um, creates a kind of Teflon on which rationality begins to slip and slide. And it's not even what the lies say, but how they bounce that's important. These superbugs become something like pure medium, activity divorced from content or meaning. So for instance, uh, uh, interference in, in any of our, like the 2016 election in the US, just to, just to, make, a, just to make an example used ideological tools with an intent to shape not ideology but disposition. So in the, in the face of counterfeit social media posts that were, for instance, fomenting hate about racism, if you were uh, a, a true to your beliefs and your ideology, you had no choice but to go out into the street and march against that hatred. And yet at the same time that you did that, you were exacerbating a binary which delivered Donald Trump. So you, you were being true to your ideology through this dispositional trick managed to deliver, by exacerbating a binary, managed to deliver something that was the polar opposite of your ideological motivation. So it's wildly dangerous to rely only on declared ideology. When, when undeclared activity or disposition may facilitate untouchable accumulations of power, environmental forms of violence. And while culture relies on these declarations, it's this deceptively simple faculty that I'm saying we're sort of good at with our canine minds, this de deceptively simple faculty for detecting dispositions or latent potentials and in relationships and arrangements remains profoundly under-rehearsed in culture. So the book that I'm writing now is to a broad audience, but using our spatial models to jostle some of that uh, habit of that addiction to the declared. And, and, and for us, now bored with just, just measuring and describing the superbug, and, and for us wanting to move beyond just a rhetorical critique that's to be consumed in various venues of cultural production or the next Biennale or something. Um, we are spatial practitioners as perplexed as anyone who's explored the conditions uh, out there, but um, maybe we can offer uh, to any discipline some forms for design activism some forms with which to actually manipulate the physical world. Um, and rather than waiting for the revolution or the client commission, design can begin even now to act in this spatial medium. So when, when working on that medium, sort of on that flip side, I'm arguing that there's a redoubled territory of, of for design, design activism, with extra political and aesthetic capacities. But there's also some expectations that are maybe inverted. For instance, one inversion, being right is a really bad idea in medium design. It's just way too weak. Solutions are probably mistakes. 
they won't work against superbugs. Uh, and besides that, nothing really works. Um, to worry that things will go wrong is to miss the point. They will always go wrong. You can only try to work on forms that achieve varying degrees of relief. In another inversion, this medium design works better, not when you're trying to eliminate problems, but maybe when you're multiplying problems and using them to leaven and catalyze each other. It's a little bit like this um, counterintuitive game theory called Pirando's Paradox, where if you're, if, you, if you're playing a losing, a game has a probability of losing and you, you, you can continue to play that and you'll continue to lose. But if for some reason, if you begin to alternate between losing games, you start to generate wins as if the losses were some kind of um, traction um, against which to make some small gains. So maybe it's not even the existence or the content of the problem, but how they interplay um, that's important. And failure is limitless, uh, constantly replenished resources for design ecology. So again, rather than waiting for the proper accumulation of capital, you can start to work on its cast-offs and its failures and its problems, things that have fallen off the ledger um, and return to their heavy values, which we know something about. In yet another inversion, more important than, you know, than that, that modern newness, um, that succession of technologies, uh, the old, new right answer kills the old right answer, is, is the relationship between technologies. So, for instance, now at a moment of digital ubiquity, rejecting the necessity of a, you know, a digital presence as the, the, the medium of innovation, that, that our spaces have to be covered with sensors and, um, and digital devices in order to be responsive. In, in, in this medium design, we, we are treating the heavy, lumpy, physical world as itself an information uh, system, information organization that's already dancing with potentials. Like Gregory Bateson observed, a man, a tree, and an axe is, a, is an information system. So not only one species of information, but the digital together with the heavy or the spatial is more information rich. Um, it's not the newness of the technologies, but the quality of the mixtures of technologies, the, the, the quality of the entanglements that might signal sophistication. And then um, finally, maybe in, in medium design, violence is also often latent. I mean, if an unsafe factory collapses or burns, as it did here in the uh, collapse in the Rana Plaza export processing zone and another of these zones, the Dhaka export processing zone in Bangladesh, th there is an event to mark the violence. But in countless factories that are sitting in those zones we were just looking at, countless factories that don't happen to buckle under the weight of their own denial, there's no... There's no event like a drawn sword. There's only latent temperament, the constant aggressions of, of blatant, imbalanced power dynamics. Um, and a, a potential for either concentrating or distributing power or a, a potential for escalating or reducing violence. And, and on the other side of this medium, on the other side, or looking at this medium, maybe there's also alternative ways to register the design imagination, sort of form making in another key or part of speech. So the object of design is interplay, not only the making of objects, but the designing of relationships between objects. I mean, we as designers, we're very good at, at making things, <laughs> at things with shapes and outlines, and we're good at that, and so we should be. But this medium design is less like making a thing and more like having your hands on the faders and toggles of organization or knowing how the thing you make puts its thumb on some other um, force or power to, to leverage something beyond it. 
It's the design of interdependencies and chemistries and chain reactions, designing then not only a single object, but a platform for inflecting populations of objects or setting up relative potentials within them. So, so then medium design would be something like playing pool, where it doesn't really do you any good to have the, you can't have the answer to playing pool. You can't, and it doesn't do you any good to sort of know about one sort of shot. Um, uh, instead, it's being able to see a branching network of possibilities that allows you to add information to the table. So you're, 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 you're making something that shouldn't always work. Um, or that, and this will sound contradictory, or, or that is, <coughs> is indeterminate to be practical. Like you, you play pool, playing pool is indeterminate to be practical because if you had a fixed idea about how it was gonna work out, you would not be a good pool player. Um, but it's funny that phrase, the indeterminate to be practical. Every time I've had that in an essay, the editor always changes it to too indeterminate to be practical, assuming that I didn't mean that it, but I, that's what I mean, that the indeterminacy is practical. So maybe we could look at some of these simple interplays. Think of a place like Nairobi. Um, it, where all the same zone videos are appearing. Um, it's, it's now flush with broadband capacities and a big share of the world's uh, billions of cell phone users now, which I now you know are most of which are in developing countries. And while this potentially changes everything, that same cocktail of master plans and standards and media fantasies are on offer, the same blunt instruments. But in Nairobi, you know, maybe you could use the zone's ambition to be a city as the germ of its own reversal. Um, think of some places like Dubai. Um, that They initially made access to their oil and gas contingent on an offset investment in some other industry that they needed. Um, you know, you had to, to invest in desalination or fish farming or something like that. And a city like Nairobi might, might similarly make a better bargain with their assets, like assets like access to those um, millions of cell phone users, by using foreign investment not on a newly minted ex-urban zone enclave, but, but as a way to leverage benefits for the city itself. So, you know, what would it be like if rather than, you know, leaving Nairobi, dusting off your hands, having left, their, left them with your genius master plan. What if instead the organ of design was something like an interplay that puts spatial variables in some kind of time-released interdependent bargain? Like the bargain that Dubai made. So the interplay, you know, the in, an interplay could link Invest, it could link anything, but, but let's just for a second just for a look at the. An interplay could link investment that's here in blue, sort of representing one of those shiny cities on the outside, um, to some shared resources. And, and again, it could be anything, but this, this one imagines that, that it's linked to transit, uh, which Nairobi desperately needs, um, and, and that benefits the city while also delivering workers to business. You know, in, in many of those shiny cities, right at the, right at the outside is the crumbling infrastructure and people walking for hours and hours just to, just to get there. Would, would this sort of urban rewiring potentially more directly return financial benefits to the domestic economy? Um, and, and, and you know, perhaps most importantly, reduce violence by returning um, workers to the protections and regulations of law. But most importantly, how, how, do, you, how do you diagram, design something that's not a solution, uh, but something that shouldn't always work, uh, not because it's marginal or weak, but actually the opposite, because it's agile enough with sufficient temporal dimensions to adapt to the next thing that Nairobi needs or, 
or respond to the moment when it's politically outmaneuvered. Many of the um, spatial products and repeatable formulas for everything from buildings to free zone cities are, are locating in this exploding urban periphery. This is a, a time lapse where you see Mumbai sort of hanging around the same size and then um, the, the periphery beginning to explode. More and more, as you know, more and more people living in cities, but living in peripheral areas that are increasingly less dense, but staggering in size. So by 2050, that peripheral area is estimated to be uh, 3.1 million square kilometers, which is the size of the entire country of India. And it's home to both gated communities and precarious poverty. This, and this, this space is a, a barometer of inequality and it was also a contributor to, um, to extremes of climate change. That development is also encroaching on sensitive landscapes. So, so consider another interplay that might be designed to not only build, but also put the development machine into reverse. So while roads we typically think of as conduits of progress and opportunity in, in rural and, and wilderness areas, but you've all seen these kinds of maps, you know they can not, these are, these are those maps of, of any, this is the, that happens to be the, the Ecuadorian Amazon, they can erase information as well that's, that's imminent in cities and villages and landscapes. So this protocol considers an interplay between broadband, roads, and forest or jungle, and it's arguing that it might be more productive to dial down roads, the gray lines, um, when you're dialing up broadband, which is the red radiating circle, to preserve an information system of heavy stuff, um, information system of, 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 of indigenous uh, communities and jungles and animals that finally attracts more global resources, like whatever that is, some cliched eco-lodge or or, uh, or um, outpost of a, a, a global research institution um, that happens to be hungry for <laughs> broadband and that serves as a source of revenue. So all, all to, to sort of think about uh, in this protocol, um, the way that a digital and a spatial or a heavy information system can work together to make each other more information rich or more information poor, and the way that changing a road as well as changing a bit of code can hack into a telecommunications network. Or consider a, a protocol for retreat from sea level rise or wildfire. This is a little, um, this is a, a, a little uh, video which is looking at um, starting with risk as a sort of a good thing. Um, it's looking at the long-term low interest mortgage that was a germ of sprawl, but also a germ of global financial disaster. And now sea level rise um, can also put those houses literally and financially underwater. But so this little protocol is absolutely simple. All it says is uh, what if those, properties can be grouped, I mean, if they could have been grouped and scored according to subprime mortgages, can they be grouped and scored not around financial abstractions, but around climate risk? Uh, and they can be given a high score if they reduce collective risk. So now risk, previously seen to be a problem, is an asset that can be traded. So a group of risky houses that couldn't have sold it to anyone before now can sell to a city. The city uses that land to build flood protection and the score is really high. Or um, sort of paradoxically, a, a previously unviable property uses its risk to attract a buyer. 
if the seller moves to high ground, the buyer can and the buyer can afford to elevate, the group score goes up. So now the property isn't maybe has a chance of not being a victim of climate gentrification, but instead um, using the buyer's wealth to mutual leveraging the buyer's wealth uh, to a larger advantage. Or it earns um, uh, a high score could reduce the insurance and, and mortgage uh, interest rates, or it earns a one-time grant towards a reduced down payment. So th then it really is like reverse engineering the long-term low interest mortgage because that $1,000 that you get towards your down payment as compounded becomes $50,000. Um, and that same protocol can be used against wildfire risk. Uh, I know this is a little complicated, a little risky to try to show something like this, but, but trying to get under the hood of the most abusive landscapes and figure out how to reverse engineer them and, and make them uh, and use them, use their kind of self amplifying powers to multiply a change. Or consider uh, an interplay about automated vehicles. This is, you know, a bit of, this is about, um, this is uh, this silly uh, ad for symbiosis where it's automated uh, vehicles are touted as the means to perfect driving, to reduce emissions, increase productivity. But in, in, again, in this kind of modern, pure embrace of a new technology, we know there is a boomerang effect. Because if all cars um, can provide the same hands-free ride that transit does, and if they're used in lieu of transit, so imagine every seat in a transit car is now ballooned out in size to be the size of car, um, then suddenly there's an unprecedented amount of congestion and emissions and sprawl. Just even with carpooling and platooning, um, the very smart vehicle would be in a really dumb traffic jam. But to and to and, you know the what does the modern mind do? The modern mind says that you know to remedy this boomerang effect, you would you would have to come up with another solution, like the next emergent technology, like futurists flying cars or something like that. But an alternative response would be to alter the. Sorry for those corny images, but 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 alternative response might be to alter the relationship, or to rewire the network with a spatial variable in a heavy spatial information system, a physical, architectural volume that acts like a switch when, when placed between existing transportation technologies. And this is obvious to us, um, but the switch, uh, an intermodal node for upshifting and downshifting into transportation of different capacities in the studies that we've been doing keeps returning um, productive uh, uh, outcomes, uh, keeps demonstrating ways in which it could organize maintenance and innovation and investment and even liability in this shifting transportation technology. Defying uh, conservative modernist scripts about newness. So again, the innovation is not the new technology. The innovation is the relationship between technologies. And space might be that medium, an underexploited medium of, of innovation. And while switching between, it, you know, it also involves changing the script of what um, constitutes pleasure and luxury and freedom. Um, because while switching between transportation modes is regarded to be an impediment to the freedom of movement, it may really be a release into the richness and speed of entanglement. Um, again, space itself, an underexploited medium. Or consider that uh, global infrastructure space that's perfectly streamlined the global movements of billions of products and tens of millions of tourists and cheap laborers at a time when over 70 million people in the world are displaced. Suddenly, there's, there's no way 
to move X million people away from atrocities like those in Syria. Suddenly, so now there's no innovation is not there. Or, or facilitate <laughs> movements related to climate or labor. The nation state just has a dumb on-off button for granting or denying citizenship or asylum. And the extra state layers of governance, like the angiocracy, offers their best idea, another solution, um, uh, storage in a refugee camp, a form of detention lasting on average 17 years. Migration portrayed uh, not as a constant resource, but as a crisis. Those migrating portrayed as victims or the other in another of these binary oppositions um, from right-wing xenophobic sentiments. So what if you wanted to alter the temperament and, and dispositional potential of the organization by moving away from the sharp end of conflict, uh, the, the refugee moment, to work on remote set of switches in the larger networks, countering the violence of the loop and the binary. Could you work on the medium to multiply those one-to-one -one exchanges that often support some of the most successful um, uh, migration? And if you could do this dispositionally and temperamentally, would you be moving from the, the one and only the nation uh, or the one in the binary to the one-to-one -one and the many. And many was a, a experimental platform we were working on to facilitate migration through an exchange of needs. And it's a platform that's kind of speaking for those who say, uh, you know, I don't really want your citizenship or your victimhood or your structured racism or bad jobs. So it's kind of like trying to steal temperamentally it's trying to, try to steal the right wing's argument and leave them to throw themselves against an open door. So saying, you know, I don't really want to stay in your country. Instead, I want another kind of cosmopolitan mobility based on a more robust networking of project-based short-term kinds of journeys or ex exchanges with no journey um, in, that, are, that, that begin to aggregate global credentials. Uh, so could there be a global form of matchmaking between the sideline talents and needs of migrating populations and a multitude of needs all around the world? No haves and have nots. Um, um, as with Perando's paradox, the needs and problems are necessary assets. There's only the putting together of problems and maybe cities also bargaining with their um, underexploited, even failed spaces to attract a changing influx of talent and resources or matching their needs and problems with the needs of others for mutual benefits. It's, um, well, we are not so naive that we didn't know that, the, I mean, the, the visa game, of course, is fraught and dangerous, and this is not a sunny one world sharing app. In fact, the app itself is not the object of design. It's just an aggregator or a prompt for a heavy information system. And besides that, nothing works. And just as you design things that shouldn't always work, how do you tell the histories? How do you work on the activism of, around the, the, the histories of things that don't happen? Um, these punctuating events like crises and competitions and victories and defeats usually capture the attention of our most familiar cultural narratives. But as we were saying before, disposition kind of doesn't happen. It's, it's, it, you don't, it's not always the drawn sword. Uh, it's ever present as a latent temperament. Just like glass doesn't have to break to be brittle, that ball doesn't have to roll down the inclined plane to have the disposition to do so. So what are the spatio-political reagents and accelerants in these gradient moments of political metastasis or remission? What, is, what does the activism look like um, in, uh, on this flip side? Maybe one thing I end up thinking about is Kubrick's uh, uh, movie Spartacus. Uh, 60s movie, 1960 movie, which you, I don't know if you have seen it, but the, it's um, there's a sort of fabled moment in the movie where uh, the Roman generals have gathered together all of their slaves who are shackled under the naked sun and 
and they, they announce that only the insurgent Spartacus will be killed if he will only identify himself. And so um, Charlton Heston, who's Spartacus, is about to stand up and say, I'm Spartacus. But then Tony Curtis, who's a fellow slave, stands up at the exact same time and says, I'm Spartacus. And then all of the slaves all around in the field say, oh, I'm Spartacus, oh, I'm Spartacus, oh, I'm Spartacus. Um, and so they, they, they do exactly what the superbug does. They created a kind of Teflon of their own. They, they changed the lexical expression. They even inverted the lexical meanings of naming and law into something dispositional. They, they, they found the power of a multiplier so that that name never even meant anything. They completely defanged their, um, their captors uh, by working in a, in, on temperament and disposition. Um, so in the medium, can you do that? Can you adjust spaces in ways that are attuned to that latent temperament? So in addition to declarations and confrontations, of course, we will always go out and march in the streets. We're really good at that, and so we should be. The, what are the additional forms of, of, of activism, that um, additional ways of reducing violence that are, are available to us? Sometimes I think that just as a designer, is a good designer is like a dog or a canine. A good designer is maybe a little bit something like the parent with squabbling children. The parent with squabbling children doesn't try to litigate the argument between the two children. What did one say to the other or the other? So it's not about declarations. The parent um, works on the dispositions and temperaments in the room. They change the, they change the temperature of the room. They introduce blood sugar into one child. They, they give a pet into the arms of another. They do a number of things, just like I think we are good at this, um, to change the chemistry of the room so that it no longer induces or supports violence. So finally, you know, think, thinking back to the superbug skills of discrepancy, while we're, you know, I said I mean, we're, maybe we're kind of bored with the safety of the purely rhetorical. At the same time, design that has any hope of affecting change is probably manipulating organizations in that heavy world, as well as instrumental narratives that attend it, um, and 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 working with potentially uh, sneakier or more political, politically agile stories. It may be a dissonant story that, however non-physical has physical consequences. It may be a narrative that makes something contagious. It, it may have an emotional message that renders some power more vulnerable, or it may have a surprising cultural bounce because of its irrationality or its outrageousness or its creepiness or its cuteness or its violence. A stealthier form of activism that mixes that stories with spatial changes. Um, with all the gifts and pandas and rumors and meaningless distractions and other totemic fictions that are so effective in culture. So this medium design, might it be a way to kind of get on with it, a kind of work to work around the modern mind? So here on the sort of other side of the trapdoor, right answers are mistakes, obligations are more empowering than freedom, Histories follow latent aggressions as well as gunshots. Messy is smarter than new. You deliberately address problems with, with approaches that shouldn't always work. And may, maybe you can steal some of the powers of that infrastructure space to design a kind of snaking chain of moves to generate leverage against intractable politics. And like a really good pool player, you wouldn't call your shots. You would keep them guessing. And so then it would be like being too smart to be right. Thank you.
um, in order to sort of couple ideology and activity when sort of participation to begin with is requisite on sort of the non into the activity, um, like capitalism, and especially the Wait, no, say, say again, what, what, you, you want some kind of... Uh, or, yeah, but like, as far as um, it seems that one of the challenges is that just to even participate in order to be able to sort of take an active um, sort of submerging against the system, just to even play the game with the war, um, one needs to sort of find into the game of the national activity of the and if one's willing to do that, By, um, uh, sort of I'm, I'm not sure I totally understand your question, but I, but I, it, uh, it, it gives me an opportunity to say that I, I am not saying that this is um, a form of collusion. Um, you know that one has to sort of. Uh, you know, ride the wave or, or join in. Uh, this is a form of manipulation um, of those markets. Um, so it's not, uh, yeah, it's not, it's not working from within or anything like that. Um, but um, even working with what those markets discard. So I don't know that it really. I don't. I don't know that it does require that one is, um, yeah, party to uh, neoliberal policies, um, but are, are instead trying to find ways to hijack some of the components that are part of those organizations. Because um, I don't know if I answer your question. Requires this acceptance of certain platform. Uh, and um, does it? You know, unfortunately, the way that existence is sort of predicated to it is um, you know, so heavily sort of burdened by existing in the urban context. And that is sort of um, uh, undermined by the necessity of believing and rationalizing that in order to be able to sort of participate in the out. Yeah. Well, I, uh, I guess I'm not really talking about opting out, but um, it, uh, I, it went by sort of fast. But um, I, I'm wondering if one of the the greatest sort of uh, or, or illusions that are that are a great pity of the sort of modern mind, you know, is that capital is all consuming. Um, 
that it is everything, you know, that it is the only source of violence, that it is the only marketplace, that it is the only way to trade, that it is, um, because then it leaves you, it leaves you with those choices that you've talked about. If you, if you buy that, like, one and only uh, capital and capitalist movements are the elementary particle that parses all, um, then, then it's true, there's really nothing to do. Can't do anything. Um, so I'm just assuming that I'm, I'm uh, whistling through the graveyard and saying, but what if it's not? Um, what if in, in, um, we, do not, we do not have to either uh, uh, defeat capitalism absolutely with our sword you know, over our head or, or wait patiently for someone to accumulate enough capital to hire us? Those two choices are don't work. Um, uh, and that's where we are now, sending our students out into kind of unsustainable careers. <laughs> um, so what if that, take away that assumption, um, start to look at the things that, uh, the ways that you can begin now, the ways in which you don't need to wait for either the revolution or the commission, um, and start to work with those things, as I was saying, start to work with those things that, that capital discards. Um, understanding um, what they are, how we understand the heavy values of things that, that, aren't, that have fallen off the ab abstract financial pleasure. What, what can, how can we start to work? So in some ways, in financial failure is a place where, for us, we could you know, roll up our sleeves. And um, uh, climate failure, it, it, it presents uh, possibilities for what we know something about. Um, the position of something in relation to how hot or wet it is. Um, the fact that, that uh, uh, a building that is financially underwater is now turned back into not a traffic mortgage product, but a building made of wood sitting on dirt. Um, th those are things I'm trying to think about, that see opportunities for us in different kinds of partnerships, and these are not, uh, these are not, this is not client-based uh, spatial practice. So I, I guess to clarify one of the Yes. Is, this is uh, aspiration for a new space that doesn't, isn't currently sort of in the same practice now. Well, yeah, I mean, it, it, you could say it's not in existence now, and yet the material for it is abundant um, and already here. Um, so it's not like we're waiting for some, you know, we have to wait again for some, yeah. Uh, well, I guess uh, my question would be, is, are you saying that it's kind of a requirement play the game cool or practice media design to kind of empty oneself of ideology. Um, and if that were the case, then like what's the innate moral guidance that you're relying on as opposed to um, a set of ethics? Or because, I mean, in comparison to like the super bug uh, who has maybe no ideology, is that what we're up against it? Is that what we need? Thank you for that question. Um, no, I'm not, I'm not saying we are abandoning our beliefs or our ideologies, but, see, but seeing how uh, the, the, seeing how the, the hope that ideology is sufficient um, is probably not going to work, um, especially against the most cunning superbugs, because they, they already know that, like, you know, bringing a reasonable idea into the world is is not is pretty weak. Um, it's like bringing a knife to a gunfight in their creed terms. So it's knowing about it's knowing both things. It's being aware of both. Um, um, I would say I'm a leftist, you know, um, uh, but it's 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 being and, and I would 
find um, you know, political salience in certain kinds of groups. Um, but I'm just saying we could, we could be aware of some extra powers. Again, you know, we, still march, we still march on the streets, but what, we still have our conventional ways of activism. But what else do we have? Um, and what else do we have, especially as designers, that is exceptionally valuable? But it is true that, that maybe I am seeing ethics not as kind of absolute principles, but ethics as struggle. I'm not seeing F truth as the one and only truth. I'm seeing truth as, a, as the mixture. Uh, Intrigued and, and wondering if there, uh, in order to achieve um, success, um, through, through some of these meetings, if you would need to, uh, if there would need to be a kind of larger collective epistemological shift to lead one towards a trajectory to be more open to the temporal um, tactics that you're talking about. And, and so I go back to kind of your, on the one hand, holding the absolutist position and kind of marching the streets is one. Uh, kind of represent, kind of symbolic representation of of what one's working towards, and then another strategy that kind of is, is in parallel that works on uh, temporal dispositions and so forth. I'm wondering um, what needs to be there in the collective consciousness. To, you know, if I don't want to march in the streets, then then uh, is that same mind and open to the dispositions or is the dispositions where you come up the streets and it's a circular reason. I mean, social movements in the past um, have been able to keep um, absolutist positions and yet struggle for incremental incrementalism and usually that that comes with kind of um, a sense of a, a nihilistic sense of that, that a generation or two is not going to be sacrificed in order to achieve that. In other words, I'm not going to achieve X in I wonder if you think the culture is really at that moment to sacrifice the I mean, climate is certainly um, comes to mind as a as more existential um, threat. Well, I'm I'm just I'm looking for things that um, that don't have to wait to start. You know that that don't have to wait to just pick up the other end of it and start working on it and around it. Um, um, that you know can be practices in any nothing that I'm again as I say there's nothing new here um, that any urbanist worth their salt is already doing all of those things is is working on a kind of unfolding sequence of things is is taking care is maintaining is working on the chemistries of spaces as they unfold over time. Um, um, and it, it, it seems that uh, there, there, there are many, there are many things that one can pick up in your hand right now and start to work. Um, um, too many, too many are passive. This part of it. Um, well, I, I just, I wonder, and certainly as an, as a. a Educator, I wonder if we give our architecture students, for instance, enough chance to rehearse what that would be like. You know, we, we tell the stories of of kind of conventional practice, and so one does have the sense that, oh, I'll have to wait. You know, I'll, I'll have to wait. I'll have to wait. I have to, um, uh, and so trying to. Uh, Trying to tell the stories of some alternative form of practice that doesn't that doesn't have to wait to get started and that finds other kinds of partnerships in the world is. Um, yeah, uh, I really appreciate the framework that you provide to think uh, of technology outside the sense of like tech solutions that would be kind of more so sense and. But I wonder if you, there's not uh, a sense of optimism still when you think of an app that even if it's just an aggregator, um, 
that kind of ambitious are possible with wiring. Even if like most of the solutions might not work, uh, isn't there such a sense of the design should kind of at least have a sense of what some of the wires to effectively make some of the form of change to find a better operating and wouldn't that in a way uh, still kind of be reduced or diluted kind of ideology within this kind of uh, technological approach? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is un, you see the underlying motivations there, and some of those. Um, uh, you know, at the same time, you know, the, the 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 discussion of something like this switch, you know, or a discussion of this exchange, um, whether it's an online app or something, doesn't even make any difference. It, you know, whether there's a there are exchanges between. Um, uh, Problems um, in, in more global networks surrounding, uh, uh, in ways that kind of index global problems, places around the world that are uh, uh, experiencing the same kind of sea level rise, or places around the world that are experiencing fire, or um, all the kinds of planetary changes that are coming so quickly. The way in which that could index the world for all kinds of exchanges, um, I mean, even to, to talk about that sounds wildly optimistic, even naive. You know, and the same same with the idea about a switch. You know, it sounds sounds. Uh, I, here I am saying something of things never work, but but then these proposals sound almost optimistic. I, I see exactly what you mean. Um, so I, I guess what you're asking is that then do, do the, or what you're saying is that the, the proposals are, ha, ha, do have some kind of positive motivation. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. With the assumption that it will, something will only last for a little while and then break. Yeah. It seems like this, this way of thinking that you're describing is really <coughs> useful for problem that we have here in LA of homelessness, that most homeless people have cell phones and they, you know, whether where they are allowed to be or where they're not allowed to be, that, that there's actually the possibility of, of engaging technology in, in, <coughs> to, uh, to start to combat a, a, a little issue for a top-down model of connection. So, so many of the digital platforms that we use are have those have those binaries within them, or have a say have a sale um, component. So they're the furthest thing from a social media. You know, they, specific uses of this word, uh, um, <coughs> even, even used to describe um, uh, rendering techniques in, uh, in um, interrogation. There's a, it's used in a very specific technical way. I'm using it in a, um, uh, what I hope is a way that it is, uh, coincides with common parlance, that it, uh, and in a way that also coincides with the philosophy of disposition, which is about events that are latent, um, but uh, you know, but that, that don't necessarily that aren't necessarily declared or do not necessarily happen, like the 
glass, so, so, so Prince Gilbert Ryle, some, someone like that, um, or other philosophers of disposition, or someone like um, um, Michael Polanyi, or there's a, you could say maybe a relay of thought about people who are think, looking at latent potentials in space that would include Gilbert, Gilbert Ryle or Michael Polanyi or J.J. Gibson and affordance, you know, or, um, or, or a, a propensity, a propensity, a tendency, a property, or, and then also brings in, of course, uh, you know, Foucault and Agamben, um, uh, uh, or Foucault and Agamben and Deleuze talking about dispositif, that thing which is, which is not completely discursive, which is the said as much as the unsaid, to quote Foucault, you know, that, that, that is embedded in physical arrangements um, that he was trying to get uh, a hold of. Um, um, yeah, so there's a, there's a, when I've been writing about it, there's a kind of discontinuous tradition or relay of uses of that word. Um, and I, I'm, I'm aware and frightened about other uses that might trigger the other sense of it, but I, I'm, I'm trying to use it in a very, very broad way. <laughs>